Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Cred COVID Readings. I'm Keith Ari de Candido, and this time around, I'm going to be doing something a little different. Uh, I'm going to be reading a story that has not been published yet. Um, it will be soon, um, but uh, this is an unpublished story, uh, which is going to appear in the anthology Badass Moms, um, edited by Mary Fan. It is about badass moms. Um, it'll be published in the summer of 2020 by Crazy 8 Press, and this is my story in it, which is called Mater, Mater Familias, which uh, in, it takes place in the same setting as my urban fantasy uh, novel, A Furnace Sealed, as well as the short story Under the King's Bridge, which I read in a previous episode of Crag COVID Readings. So it's all part of the same uh, universe and um, with new characters, although I suspect we will be seeing these characters again when I write the second Ram Gold Adventure, which is uh, one of my upcoming projects for this year. So anyway, here is Matar Familias by Keith Ari de Candida. Excuse me, coach. Yolanda Rodriguez couldn't help but smile at being called that. She looked up from the small desk in her cramped office at Pinehurst CrossFit on 181st Street in Upper Manhattan. The person that stood in the doorway to that office was one she hadn't seen in a decade, back when she was a gym teacher and volleyball coach at Cardinal Marini High School. Maggie! Come on in, girl, sit your ass down! And hey, ain't nobody called me coach since I, was, since I left Marini. It's Yolanda. Letting out a small smile, Maggie St. Ives stepped in and sat down, adjusting her glasses as she did so. I, I can't call you that. You're, you're coach. Honestly, none of us on the volleyball team thought you had a first name, that your mom and dad just named you coach as a baby. Yolanda laughed. You want me to sign you up for some CrossFit? Maggie shook her head, her ash blonde hair brushing her shoulders. No, I mean, maybe after I finish grad school, but um, I, I, I don't have time right now. I'm, I'm here because because of what I heard about why, why you left, Marini. Nodding slowly, Yolanda said, you need a courser. You think so? Maggie, unsurprisingly, sounded unsure. Yolanda's potential clients almost always did. Blowing out a breath, Yolanda leaned back in her chair. You gotta be sure, Maggie. Come on, tell me what you came down here for. Okay, so I'm still living with my mom and dad in the building on Dykeman? And, well, weird stuff's been happening. I, I heard that your husband got attacked by a Sasquatch and then he became a monster hunter, so maybe you can help us? Yolanda had hoped that Maggie's always phrasing things as a question would change once she'd achieved adulthood, but apparently not. It wasn't a Sasquatch, it was a Wendigo, and yeah, I became a courser after that. So why are you working at a CrossFit place? Smiling, Yolanda said, more flexible hours than Marini. And it means I don't gotta rent an office for courser business. Your boss is okay with that? This place got a nasty leprechaun infestation that I got rid of, so the owner's all grateful. Let's me do what I want. Maggie blinked. Leprechauns infest things? All the damn time, Yolanda shuddered, especially in mid-March. So tell me, Maggie, what's the weird stuff that's happening? Okay, so our building's only five stories, and there's only one apartment on each floor? Yolanda nodded. New York City zoning laws were that any building six stories or higher had to have an elevator. So there were a lot of five-story apartment buildings in town. You still got that garden? Oh yes, it's going great! Maggie smiled at that, and Yolanda did as well. The St. Ives family lived in a co-op in Inwood, and the five owners of the building had created a community garden in the small courtyard next to the building. Yolanda had very fond memories of the bounty from that garden that Maggie had brought to the volleyball team in the past. The owners also sold some of their herbs and fruits and vegetables to various markets and stores in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, which helped pay the building's taxes. We also have a laundry room in the basement, and, well, that's where the weird stuff is. Maggie shifted in the guest chair and adjusted her glasses again. Can I get you a drink? Uh, we got soda, vitamin water, Gatorade. Yolanda started to stand up, hoping to get her to focus on something to relieve the tension. Waving her hands back and forth, Maggie said, No, 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 I'm, I'm fine. I just, 
I'm nervous about asking you. I'm nervous about seeing you again. I'm nervous about what's happening, but I just gotta say it. Sitting back down, Yolanda said, You got nothing to be nervous about, Maggie. Just tell me. Every time in the last week that someone's gone to do laundry, they come out soaking wet. Yolanda blinked. How? We have no idea! Maggie threw up her arms. They go in with their laundry, they come out soaked, and they don't remember anything that happened in between. How many people? Six so far. We've looked in the laundry room, and it's all fine. But once someone goes in, soaked. Them and their laundry. I mean, it's great business with the laundromat over on Broadway, but... Maggie trailed off. And Yolanda nodded. This definitely sounded like coarser business. All right, I'll come to your building tonight and check it out, okay? What time's good? After they agreed that Yolanda would come by at 7.30 that evening, they then discussed her fee. Maggie had apparently been given an upper figure that the co-op board was willing to pay for her services and was very obviously relieved when Yolanda quoted a figure lower than that. Once that was all taken care of, Maggie zipped out of the office as if someone had lit, a guest, lit the guest chair on fire. Yolanda couldn't help but smile at the memory of how hard she used to push the volleyball players. She knew that they called her Red Card Rodriguez behind her back, and she had actually kind of enjoyed that. She kept working, doing CrossFit sessions with some clients until 5.30, when she had to walk down the hill to the after-school place on Riverside Drive to pick up Eduardo. Her eight-year-old son was still wearing his karate gi and yellow belt when she came in, and he ran up the ramp to the front door to hug her leg. Mommy! How was class, baby boy? Eduardo extracted himself from her leg and gave her a pouty look. I ain't a baby no more, Mommy. You always gonna be my baby boy, baby boy. Best be getting used to that. How was class? Sensei taught me a new kata today. Can I show you and Analia? Maybe tomorrow. After we get home, Mommy and Analia and Camila got work to do. But you can show Poppy, okay? Yay! After exchanging some quick pleasantries with the staff of the after-school program, as well as the karate teacher who said that Eduardo had done very well on the kata for his first time, she and Eduardo walked back up the steep hill that was 181st Street toward Fort Washington, stopping at one of the bodegas to get a Granny Smith apple for their pet dragon, Magellan, then cut over to 179th Street and then down to their apartment building. What's the work you gotta do, Mommy? Eduardo asked as they got into the cramped elevator that slowly herky-jerked its way up to the sixth floor. I got a client at work. Something's happened in a building up on Dykeman. Is it a scary monster? Don't know yet. Me and Analia are going to go check it out tonight. After the elevator stumbled into place on, the, on six and the inner door slid open, she pushed the metal outer door open and they went to the end of the hallway. We're home, she announced as she unlocked and entered their cramped three-bedroom apartment. The only room of size in the apartment was the living room, but you'd never know what to look at it, as it not only had a couch, a big chair, the television, and several bookcases, but also a big computer desk with two computers on it and Carlos's drafting table. To Yolanda's left was the kitchen, as well as the short hallway that led to two of the bedrooms. Analia was in the former, standing over the stove. It smelled like she was frying up some chicken, and her oldest daughter was standing in a miasma of smoke from the burning oil. Turn the fan on, Analia. Yolanda said, amazed that the smoke detector hadn't gone off yet. Eduardo ran into the kitchen, put his fists in front of his stomach, and then bowed and said, Oh, senpai! Yolanda grinned. The after-school karate teacher was from the same karate school in the Bronx that Analia attended, and from which she'd received her junior black belt last year. Every time he came back from a karate lesson, he went and bowed to his 17-year-old sister. Analia nodded and said, Us, how was class? I learned a new kata. Pinan too? Analia asked. Uh-huh. Leaving two of her children to geeble over martial arts, Yolanda moved forward into the living room. Her middle child, the 15-year-old Camila, was sitting at one of the computers while Carlos was hunched over his drawing board. He had taken the prosthetic leg off, leaving it to stand beside the drafting table. Carlos looked up from the latest issue of the superhero comic he was illustrating to kiss Yolanda. How goes, Lara? Yolanda sighed. She knew it was true love because she let him call her Lala, something that would have gotten literally anyone else in the world her foot up their, their ass. 
Got a job. One of my old students from Marini. She filled the family in on what Maggie St. Ives had told her. Carlos rubbed the stump that was all that was left of his right leg after the Wendigo had chewed it off. Ain't she the one who gave you all those tomatoes after you won the state t championship that year? Yeah, they got a community garden next to the building. She turned and headed toward the other side of the living room, which had the master bedroom as well as the bathroom. I'm a shower. We'll eat. Then Analia and I'll head up to Inwood to check the place out. Camila, you hit the books, hit the net. See what, what can get people wet without nobody remembering how or why. I'm on it, Mommy, Camila said with a thumb, thumbs up. Just as she was about to enter the bedroom, she shot Camila a look. Your homework's done, right? That got Yolanda the look. Camila peered over her plastic-framed glasses at her. Mommy, come on. Yolanda smiled. It was rare that Camila didn't have all her homework done long before dinner. Continuing into the master bedroom, she saw that Magellan was curled up in the basket in the corner, smoke belching out from his nostrils as he slept. The Green Dragon had followed Yolanda home after a job once, and Camilla and Analia had both insisted that they keep the friendly, affectionate beast. Yolanda had named him Magellan after the Green Dragon in Eureka's Castle, one of Yolanda's favorite kids' shows from when she was a little girl. Reaching into her purse, she grabbed the white paper bag from the bodega, pulled out the apple, and tossed it into the basket. Magellan opened one eye, let out a puff of smoke, said, Phew! and then fell back asleep, his tail wrapping around the apple. Saving it for later is okay, too, Yolanda said with a chuckle. After wolfing down the chicken dinner, Analia and Yolanda walked to Broadway and took the M100 bus uptown to Dykeman Street, and then walked down to the five-story building near the Henry Hudson Parkway overpass. Maggie and her parents, Jeremy and Rachel, were waiting for them on the stoop. Rachel smiled at them. Coach Rodriguez, it's good to see you again. It's Yolanda. I haven't been a coach in ages. This is my daughter, Analia. Doing a double take, Rachel's eyes widened. My goodness, that's Analia? She was just a baby the last time I saw her. That wasn't quite accurate. Analia was seven when Yolanda last saw the St. Ives family, which was right after they won the state championship. But this wasn't the time to get into it. Can I see the basement? Nodding, Jeremy led them to the door under the stoop that went to the basement. He opened the door with a key, then started to lead Yolanda and Analia in, but Yolanda stopped him from entering. You stay with Maggie and Rachel on the stoop, okay? We'll check it out. Jeremy seemed to deflate with relief. You bet! And he practically ran out the door up to the sidewalk. The doorway led to a dank hallway with an uneven concrete floor and dark walls that seemed to be closing in on them. At the far end of the hallway was a door that Yolanda assumed led to the interior staircase, which was how the basement was accessed from inside. To the left were a couple of large metal doors that were shut tight. One was labeled boiler, the other storage room. To the right, a door with a window, the door labeled laundry. Peering inside, she saw a room with two washers and two dryers. That's all they got? Analia said while peering into the door's window. The building only has five units, Yolanda said while she rummaged around in her purse for a Miliucci charm. Once activated, it could tell if there was magic nearby. Analia stood with her hands on her hips while Yolanda dug around the purse. You know, my friend Soraya's mom is an archaeologist. I was thinking maybe she could help you find stuff in there. You're hilarious, baby girl. Ha! She finally found it buried beneath a silver stick and her spare maxi pads. She shook it, and it started to glow green. Definitely magic. Good. If it wasn't magic, they'd probably want their money back. Now what? Well, now you go in there. Analia blinked and backed away from her mother. Excuse me? You want me to go in there? Where people get all wet? Hell yeah, why do you think I brought you along? Oh, mommy, I'm a black belt. I'll protect you out there. I'll fight the monsters. I never said that. You didn't hardly say nothing else for a year before I started taking you on jobs. So get your narrow behind in that laundry room. If I'd have known, I'd have brought my bathing suit. She sighed. Okay, fine, but here. Reaching into the pocket of her jeans, she pulled out her smartphone, covered in an otter box case that also held her cash, ID, and MetroCard. Hold that. Yolanda dropped the phone in her purse, 
while Analia opened the door and entered the laundry room. Nothing happened. However, the Miliucci's charm's glow became more intense. Analia turned around. Just standing here. I... Then her eyes went wide. What the fuck? What is it, baby girl? Her daughter shuddered. It's gone now. But I thought I saw, well, something. I thought it was a lady with a lot of hair, but... She shuddered again. Crazy. The Miliucci charm was now glowing blue and then went dark. Whatever magical thing was nearby was gone now. Yolanda went into the laundry room also and looked around. See anything weird? Analia asked. Yeah, somebody uses gain. That stuff smells nasty. Aside from that, no. Analia indicated the far corner of the laundry room with her head. Where's that door go? Why? Because that's where I saw the lady with the hair. Did she go out the door? Shaking her head, Analia said, no, no, she just went poof. Well, let's check anyhow. Yolanda walked over to the door. There was a shallow puddle right in front of it, which she stepped over. The door itself was unlocked and opened inward to a short staircase that went up to the alley next to the building. Remembering that the alley had the modest community garden, she went up the stairs, only to find herself in the midst of a much larger garden than she remembered. Walking around with her mouth hanging open, Yolanda navigated a very thin pathway through the alley and the courtyard in the back. Didn't realize this garden was so big, Analia said. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't ten years ago. All around them were tomato plants, cucumbers, raspberry bushes, strawberries, a whole section full of herbs and more. They walked single file through the garden toward the street. A gate at the end was, luckily, easy to open from the inside. Rachel was still sitting on the stoop, and she looked up in surprise to see Yolanda and Analia come out from out the alley gate rather than the basement. She rose to her feet. Why are you in the garden? Analia was about to say something, but Yolanda cut her off. Uh, we thought we saw something in the doorway to the garden from the basement. Has anyone who doesn't live in the building gone into the laundry room? I don't think so. But you could check with the other tenants. Jeremy went off to gather everyone in our place. I'm the president of the co-op board, and I asked everyone to make sure someone was home around now to talk to you. We figured it'd be easier if they were all together. Yolanda nodded. Good. She would have preferred to talk to them individually and separately, as they might admit things to just her that they wouldn't want to say in front of their neighbors, but it was too late for that now. Rachel went to unlock the front door. Whispering to Analia, Yolanda said, Text your sister, describe what you just saw, and see if she can find anything like that. Analia said, Fine, but that means you got to give me my phone back. Oh, right. Yolanda rummaged around in her purse, trying to locate the outer box. You guys okay? Rachel asked from the now open front doorway. Just trying to find Analia's phone, Yolanda said with a sigh. Soraya's mom, Analia said in a sing-songy voice. As she pushed aside the battery pack, her wallet, and a Hassan amulet, she muttered, Remember that I can kill you any time and say the dragon did it. Magellan would never hurt me. Keep telling yourself that. She finally found the outer box and fished it out handing it to Analia. Here you go. They finally followed Rachel inside, and she led them to the back of the building and the staircase up to the third floor, which is where the St. Ives family lived. Yolanda felt a pang of envy as she entered the large apartment that took up the entire floor of the building. They walked into a huge living room that by itself seemed to be as big as Yolanda's entire apartment. To the left as they entered was a dining room, with a kitchen and bathroom beyond it, and to the right, on the very far end of the living room, were two doorways, which Yolanda figured led to the two bedrooms. Seated around the living room on the couch, the wrought iron rocking chair, the recliner, and three folding chairs were many of the other tenants in the building. Two elderly white people shared the couch with Maggie, while two Latin guys who were holding hands sat on two of the folding chairs with Jeremy on the third. An Indian woman sat on the edge of the rocking chair, while an African-American man lounged on the recliner. A coffee table in front of the couch had a big bowl filled with golden raspberries with some small bowls on the side. Yolanda assumed they were from the garden. There was a spoon in the big bowl, and several of the tenants had small bowls of the fruit in front of them. Yolanda noticed that while the furniture was all nice and all basically went with each other, it didn't all match perfectly, and they were all different ages. The recliner looked brand new, 
while the couch was very obviously old and well used. Rachel said, everyone, this is Yolanda Rodriguez, the courser we hired. She's going to take care of our laundry room problem. Yolanda, this is Dimitri and Olga from the first floor, Rachel said, indicating the older couple, then pointed at the other couple. Alvaro and Hector, who live on two. Leon, who lives with his wife and kids on four, she added, pointing at the man in the recliner. Then finishing with the woman in the rocking chair. And Aditi, who lives with her roommate on five. This is my daughter, Analia, Yolanda said. Thank you all for coming tonight. First off, can each of you tell me how it went when you went into the laundry room? Each told their version of the story, which all matched what Maggie had described in Yolanda's office. Leon added, I, I went with my wife one of the times, and she stayed out in the hall. She didn't see anything, though. Said the room went all dark. She thought it was a power outage or something at first, but the hall light was still on, so... He shrugged. Just like everyone else, though, I don't remember any of it. Yolanda nodded. Did any of you see anyone strange in the laundry room at any point? Or see anyone in the building or out in the garden you don't know? Everyone looked at each other, and they all shook their heads. Aditi said, I don't think any of us would know about the garden except for Dimitri. It has become his task of late. That surprised Yolanda. I thought you all worked on it. Olga smiled. It was supposed to be, but it was very difficult to maintain for us. We almost were losing the garden, but when Dimitri, he retired, he took it over. Dimitri shrugged. I have nothing better to do. My Dima is too modest, Olga said. He has done wonders. I've seen that. Yolanda was impressed. She had assumed that the expansion of the garden was a group effort. That it was accomplished by one person was impressive as hell. And you've seen nothing strange in the garden, Dimitri? He shook his head and rubbed his fingers on his thick white mustache. Only squirrels trying to eat the strawberries. Is anything else different in the building lately? Again, everyone exchanged glances and shrugged. Aditi said, The last significant change of any note was seven years ago when Laura and Peter divorced and sold the fifth floor and Hector and Alvaro bought it. Alvaro frowned. That was eight years ago. Yes, it was. Rachel said, and Aditi's right, that's the last real change, apart from Dimitri turning a raggedy little garden into a cornucopia. At some point, Analia had scooped some raspberries for herself, and suddenly cried out, Hot damn, these are good! Yolanda stared at Analia. I'm sorry for my daughter. But mommy, you should taste these, these they're amazing! Shaking her head, Yolanda grabbed a raspberry. It was the most succulent, glorious raspberry she'd ever had. She'd only had res red raspberries up until now, and this golden one was sweeter than expected, and lighter as well. It is amazing. Hector's phone buzzed, and he glanced at it, then asked, Is there anything else? Our dinner just arrived. Yolanda nodded. I think we're okay for now. I'll do some digging and come back when I have something. Maggie went into the kitchen and put together a Tupperware filled with golden raspberries, and also a several, several paper bags filled with herbs that Analia salivated over. Sage, oregano, thyme, and rosemary. Wish I got this before I made dinner tonight, Analia said as they walked outside. The sage would have been amazing on the chicken. They took the M100 back down to 179th Street and arrived home to see Magellan was awake and curled around Camila's neck. She and Carlos were both on the couch watching television, but Carlos snagged the remote and turned it off when they came in. Eduardo's in bed, Carlos said. He showed me his new kata and showed me all the homework he did, and I read him the script from the latest comic book. He might be asleep now, or he might be reading more comics on his iPad. Yeah, no might about it. He's reading comics, Yolanda sighed. Did you? Yes, Carlos said. I told him that the next time he falls asleep and drops the iPad on his face and breaks a tooth, we won't get it fixed like we did the last time. And since he's eight, I'm sure he'll listen to that advice. Camila, meanwhile had gotten up slowly so as not to discommode Magellan too much, and gone over to the computer desk. Tapping the spacebar reactivated the monitor, and Yolanda saw that she had several different images up. Some were photographs that Yolanda recognized from other coursers who'd shared them. Others were drawings of creatures. All of them were women with a lot of hair, and many were also very obviously creatures of water. Okay, so based on the whole getting drenched thing... Camilla said, and based on that really crappy description Analia gave me? Hey! 
Analia lightly punched her sister on the arm as she moved to stand next to Yolanda behind her. Camila ignored her sister's abuse and continued. I've narrowed it down to either a selkie, a sin, 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 excuse me, try that again, a sihonaba, a kelpie, or a rusalka. Analia, however, was pointing right at the image in the upper right, which was a woman with incredibly long, wet hair that covered most of what seemed to be a naked body. That one. The Rusalka? Nodding, Analia said, that's what I saw in the laundry room. It can't be a Rusalka, Yolanda said. They're spirits of the dead, aren't they? Unclean women who died or some damn thing? At that, Camilla let out a soft sigh, and Yolanda knew that her little girl, who was the youngest member of the National Honor Society at her school, was about to give a lecture. Not that Yolanda minded. While having Analia to help with the physical stuff was useful, Yolanda was more grateful for her, her incredibly smart younger daughter's assistance, because Camila was much better at keeping track of all the supernatural histories and stories that were part of a courser's life. Yolanda herself had never been able to keep it straight. In fact, it was Camila, after the fact, who informed her that it was a Wendigo that maimed Carlos, not a Sasquatch. Pushing her glasses up her nose, Camila said, Okay, remember how you first, how when you first told me and Analia about all the monster stuff after Poppy got hurt, and you said that everything people think about vampires is wrong because the, in the 19th century, a bunch of writers made up stupid stuff? Yolanda chuckled. Yeah. Well, same thing with Rusalki. Nobody associated them with evil until the 19th century. They were water spirits from Eastern Europe that would irrigate the fields. Holy shit! Analia cried out. Hey, language! Carlos said from the couch. She's right, though, Yolanda said. Usually when something spooky shows up, it's because something's changed. Only thing that's changed in that building for eight years is the garden. It's way bigger. And the raspberries are awesome, and the herbs, mmm. Analia made a happy noise. Okay, Camila said. So you think maybe the Rusalka is irrigating the garden? That's why it's so big? It gets better, Yolanda said. The guy who runs the garden all by himself is a Russian immigrant. Carlos leaned forward on the couch. What do you think it means, Lala? I think we need to find a Rosalka that's irrigating the garden. She may be flooding the residents out of revenge. The question is... She blew out a long breath and looked at Camila. How do we find it? I... Uh... Camila looked away. What? Yolanda prompted. Well, it... She hesitated again. Yolanda glowered at her daughter. It's on the list, isn't it? With a nod, Camilla said, But yes, but you can't take Magellan. He might get hurt. He can take care of himself. Yolanda looked to the ceiling in supplication. Green dragons had a limited ability to detect certain magical creatures. Camilla had been assembling a list of them ever since they got Magellan, and apparently Rusalki were on it. Can't you find the Rusalka on your own? Maybe eventually, but Magellan can do it faster. Analia stepped up to her sister and pet the dragon on his head currently resting on Camila's right shoulder. I'll protect the little guy, I promise. Camila was pouting, but she said, Okay. Nah, Magellan said, and he uncurled himself from Camila's shoulders and climbed up Analia's arm. So when do we go, Mommy? Analia asked. No time like the present. I thought we need to do a lot more research. We? Camila said indignantly. Yolanda ignored that. But it looks like we need to take a closer look at Dimitri and Olga. Let's go. Um, hang on. Uh, Analia looked at Camila. I need your metro card. Why? Because mine ran out on the trip back. Well, why can't you use Poppy's? Carlos grinned. Because mine is for disabled people, and I don't think the driver will buy it from Analia. Yolanda rolled her eyes. We don't got time for this. Camila, give your sister the metro card. I'll buy a new one when we get paid for this job. Fine. Camila reached for her purse, which was on the desk, and fished out her metro card. As Analia triumphantly took the transit card from her younger sister, Yolanda went to the closet near the front door. I just hope I can find the damn Opale am amulet. They took the M100 back up again, with Magellan curled up asleep in Yolanda's purse. When they got down Dykeman to the building, Yolanda rang the buzzer labeled with a one. A burst of static came from the speaker next to the buzzer. It's Yolanda Rodriguez, she said in response. The door buzzed and they entered. Olga was standing in the doorway to the first floor apartment. Privyet, Yolanda, we did not expect to see you again so soon. 
Uh, we have some more information, and we need to start checking all the apartments. Mind if we start with you, since you're on the first floor? Analia shot Yolanda a look, but didn't say anything, thankfully. It was better to be nice to the couple, rather than antagonistic. Olga shrugged. Хорошо. She let them inside. This apartment had the same floor plan as the St. Ives place on 3, but the furniture was completely different. It was all matching and recently purchased. The dining room and living room both had what were obviously sets. Yolanda opened the purse. Don't be alarmed, okay? I got a dragon in here. Pfft, Magellan said as he poked his head out of the purse. Okay, Magellan, Yolanda said, I need you to find the Rosalka. What did you say? Olga asked in surprise. We think a Rosalka is responsible for what's happening in the laundry room. Well, that makes this no sense. Rusalki, they are simply bedtime stories, not real. Like dragons? Analia asked snidely. Yolanda glared at her daughter and then said, Just trust me, okay? Magellan leapt out of the purse and spread his tiny wings to start flying around the apartment. The muffled sound of a toilet flushing was followed by Dimitri coming out of the bathroom. What is going on? Olga waved her arms around. This mad woman has brought a dragon into our home and says there was, there was Salka in the building. Why are we wasting the co-op's money to pay this? Cool. That was Magellan, who was flying back and forth in front of a closet in the corner of the dining room near the bathroom that Dimitri had just come out of. Yolanda smiled. Good work, Magellan. You get peanut butter on your apple tonight. Get that thing away from there, Dimitri cried out. Olga was a bit calmer, oddly. It is merely the linen closet. Yolanda moved toward the closet, but Dimitri yelled, No! You will not go in there! What does it matter? Olga asked. While Yolanda grabbed the closet doorknob, Dimitri moved to a sideboard that was against the dining room wall. The closet door didn't budge at first. Then Yolanda saw the bolt near the top of the door. Just as she was reaching up to slide it aside, Dimitri pulled out what looked to Yolanda like a very old Makarov pistol of the type used by Russian soldiers and police in the 1950s. Holding it initially with his right hand, he steadied his grip with his left while taking off the safety. Walk away now, Dimitri said. Dima, what are you doing? Olga cried out. I thought I told you to get rid of that gun. Be silent! Dimitri snapped at his wife without looking at her. He was keeping his eye on Yolanda, his intended target. She is ruining everything! So focused was he on Yolanda that he didn't see Analia moving at him from his right until it was too late. She grabbed his right hand and twisted his wrist so that his hand was facing palm downward. The speed and harshness of the action caused Dimitri to let go with his left hand, and then Analia was able to pull the gun down and out of Dimitri's right hand. Then she gave him a knee kick to the nuts. Very gingerly putting the Makarov on the dining room table while Dimitri whimpered, Analia said, Go for it, Mommy. Good job, baby girl. Yolanda slid the bolt aside and opened the closet door. Inside was a girl, little girl with huge blue eyes and long, wet brown hair covering her body. She was also shivering. Olga stared at the closet in disbelief. Who is that? Then she turned to Dimitri, still doubled over in pain from Analia's knee in his balls, and let loose with a lengthy string of what Yolanda thought was invective in rapid-fire Russian. Um, Mommy? Analia said. That ain't what I saw in the laundry room. Lady I saw was taller, she was a redhead, and she had brown eyes that were more normal size than that. The girl said something that also sounded like Russian. Olga? Yolanda said, what's she saying? His voice strained. Dimitri said, say nothing! Ignoring her husband, Olga said in a hard voice, she says she is trapped in the closet and cannot leave. I figured it'd be something like that. Yolanda poked around in her purse. At first she thought it, she found it next to the hair sticks, but that was the Hassan amulet. Finally, she unearthed the Opali amulet beneath the pack of tissues and the vial of holy water. What is that? Olga asked. An Opali amulet. If a magical creature's been enslaved, this'll free it. Got three charges in it, and this is the third, so after this, it's just a paperweight. Even as she shifted the lever on the amulet to the right to activate it, she wondered how the hell she was going to be able to afford to replace it, as they were not cheap. She only had this one because it had been a birthday present from Frank Hamraj, the courser she was apprenticed to when she started. The amulet glowed, and then the young woman stood up and leapt out of the closet. 
Yes, my burden! Dimitri was finally standing upright instead of hunched over, though his hands were still near his groin. Sukablaya, you've ruined everything! A woman then appeared in front of the dining room window. She had long red hair and brown eyes. Is that... Yolanda started. Oh, yeah, Analia said with an emphatic nod. That's the laundry lady. The woman, the Rusalka, said something in Russian. Bonjour, moi, Olga muttered. She, she says she is mother and asks who freed her daughter from bondage. Yolanda raised her hand. Spasiba, the, mo the mother Rusalka said. You're welcome, Yolanda said. Olga said something in Russian also, then added to Yolanda and Analia, I have apologized for my idiot husband. The Rusalka said something else. Olga's shoulders slumped. Hasho. The two Rusalki disappeared then, leaving only a puddle in the middle of the dining room floor. Our punishment, Olga said slowly, is that our garden will be ruined forever. She smacked Dmitri on the arm and hit him with some more rapid-fire Russian. Magellan had settled on Yolanda's shoulder. To Analia, she said, I think we'd better let these, leave these two to their marital bliss. She grabbed the Makarov off the dining room table and put the safety back on, also removing the clip. Please, Olga said to Yolanda, take that away. Dimitri started, Olga, I say nothing, Dima. You promised me you got rid of the gun. Now I fulfill your promise. Yolanda put the clip and the weapon into her purse, and she also said, Magellan, in you go. Come on, for the bus ride. Pfft. But Magellan did as he was told. I'll send a bill to the co-op board, she said, leading Analia out the door. As they walked out onto Dykeman Street and turned right toward Broadway and the bus, Analia said, So what you gonna do with the gun? Hopefully. Sell it for a new Opali amulet. Good, Analia said emphatically. She did not like guns. Neither did Yolanda, so the revulsion in her daughter's voice on the subject of this one heartened her. Gotta say, Analia added, really sucks that I'll never get to eat those raspberries again. Yolanda rolled her eyes. You'll live. Besides, it wasn't worth enslaving a girl. Got that right. Just glad she's got also got a mommy to come after her. Yolanda grinned and wrapped her arm around her daughter. Damn right. Let's go home, baby girl. The end. That story will be in Badass Moms coming this summer from Crazy 8 Press. It's edited by Mary Fan uh, and features a whole bunch of other really cool people writing about uh, moms who are badass. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please subscribe to the channel and uh, stay tuned for further updates. Uh, there's a little bell on the... Uh, on the channel page, which will uh, give you alerts every time there's a new video uploaded. Um, please check me out on the web at decandido.net, read my blog at decandido.wordpress.com, and please support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash cred. Thank you so much, and stay safe.